Immersion has long been a topic of discussion in video games, getting thrown around whenever a reviewer likes a game, to the point where it's kinda lost all meaning, just like atmospheric, or when Ubisoft uses the word iconic. Immersion is too often used incorrectly in relation to realism, to the point where the very first result when googling immersive games brings us to an article about immersive games where the URL is quite literally realistic open world games. But that's game rant, so take that for what you will. Anyway, the definition of the word immersion refers to being deeply engaged or involved, which doesn't necessarily involve realism in any way. Today we'll be taking a look at what immersion looks like in games using some examples of the ways that immersion can be built and the ways that immersion can be broken, and then we'll figure out where realism actually fits into the equation. As always, feel free to sound off in the comments and tell me why I'm wrong. Let's start by clearing up exactly what immersion is before we continue. Going off of the original definition of the word as being deeply engaged or involved, we can say that being immersed in a video game is when you find yourself playing something that's taking up all of your attention and actively pulling you into its world, story, or mechanics. Realism can aid in this by presenting you with engaging and believable interactions, but it's not the sole provider of immersion. Any aspect of the game that serves to draw you into the experience can be a driver of immersion. What immersion is not, however, is the obsessive pursuit of realism, whether it be in the graphics or mechanics of a game. Realism for its own sake can hurt our ability to engage with games, breaking us out of that all-important flow state and destroying our sense of immersion. A big shift in experience can really take you out of it, unlike the super smooth segue where I remind you to like and subscribe. Anyway, immersion can be difficult to talk about, not only because I have now said the word way too many times and it's lost all meaning, but because it's an abstract concept that people experience in different ways. Games that I find immersive will likely not be the same games that you do, but here we're going to explore some of the different ways that games can build immersion, using some examples of games that immersed me in one way or another. When people talk about realism and immersion, getting immersed in a world is often the first thing that comes up. It's a living, breathing space and you can go to that mountain over there and all those other things E3 presentations used to go on about. This type of immersion can be built in two ways, through the world itself and through your interactions with the world. When we're talking about a world being immersive and believable in its own right, Rockstar games like Red Dead Redemption 2 tend to be considered the gold standard and with good reason. They are richly detailed and full of NPCs who go about their own lives and do things independently of the player, which effectively creates the illusion of a space that exists even when you're not there. This is an example of realism aiding in immersion, since it mirrors the type of things that we would expect to see in a real life setting, instantly creating a baseline level of familiarity with what we are interacting with, which lets us know inherently how to exist and act in this space, removing a potential source of friction between us and the game. The other way that immersion in a world can be built is through the way that it reacts to the player. If we know what we can expect to be the consequences of our actions, and we can see those consequences happen, then it's much easier to get immersed in an experience. Take the faction system in Fallout New Vegas, for example. It makes sense that if I kill a bunch of NCR members that they won't like me anymore because that's what would happen in real life. The people that I killed stay dead, and their surviving buddies now hate me. I do something to a group and their reaction is logical, predictable, and more importantly, lasting. While this may be a pretty simple example, it illustrates the concept we're talking about nicely. If the things you do in a world have lasting consequences on that world, it adds to the sense that you're exerting influence on a space rather than simply existing in it. This builds immersion by creating consequences for the things that you do in a game that extend beyond immediate reactions, forcing you to consider your choices more carefully than you might if the status quo just reset itself the next time you boot up the game. Games can also, naturally, immerse you in their stories, both by providing compelling narratives that you can't wait to keep experiencing, and by telling a story that you are affecting in a meaningful way while you play, linking your interactions with the game to the story that is unfolding. The first way this works is pretty much the same as how other forms of media keep you immersed, by presenting you with interesting characters and situations that you want to know more about. While they would later provide us with many, many examples of how exactly not to do this, an easy example of this in action is the first season of Telltale's Walking Dead series. With very little in the way of interactivity, the draw of this game is entirely down to the story, and it's an easy one to get invested in. We naturally gravitate to Lee's redemptive arc as he cares for Clementine over the course of the story, and it's easy to find yourself immersed in this title because the story it tells is compelling and mostly well paced, and you want to know what comes next. The other way that a story can immerse us in a game is by tying that story to our actions and putting us in greater control. While this can be accomplished somewhat through branching story paths, that's not what we're looking at here, since that's really the same kind of experience provided by a choose-your-own-adventure book. 
What we're talking about is when our performance in the gameplay loop of a game has an impact on the story the game is telling and how it unfolds. The best example I can think of for this is Pyre. Not only is the story of this game beautifully told, but the game leverages the story to raise the stakes of certain encounters, where if you lose that match, you lose a chance to rescue one of your teammates. This greatly deepens the immersion of the game, since there are finite chances to save your friends, it's impossible to save all of them anyways, and the skill you demonstrate while playing is directly tied to how the story will turn out. The challenges of the game mirror the challenges the characters experience in the story, creating a situation where you can be pulled in and truly immersed in what you're doing. The last major way the game can immerse us is in their mechanics. When the raw experience of playing a game is satisfying, the actions that you are taking provide you with a sense of flow and engagement. We'll split this up into two for the sake of consistency, direct mechanical engagement and overall mechanical engagement. When you're being directly mechanically immersed, that is the minute to minute, second to second action of a game that is pulling you in. A perfect example of this is Tetris Effect, the smoothest to play version of Tetris ever to exist. The audio visual presentation deserves a shout out, naturally, but mechanically it's just very smooth to play and I can find myself easily getting stuck into it for hours at a time. It is a top-notch operation in every possible facet, from the menus to the gameplay, and that absolute lack of friction allows you to get deeply immersed in the experience of just playing the game in the moment that you're playing it. Overall mechanical immersion relates to mechanics that aren't necessarily omnipresent in your moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, but that are affected by it and are also, ultimately, satisfying to engage with. The fact that Civilization games are fun to play at all is a testament to this. Anybody who has ever played an entire game concurrently knows what I'm talking about, as the one more turn mentality takes over and suddenly you've been reported missing by your neighbor. At a glance, these types of games look anything but immersive. Our screen is filled with garbage and numbers, and no individual turn is necessarily super impactful. What the game does to get you immersed though, is provide compelling large scale mechanics that interact with each other and provide you with a reason to slog through all those early game turns where you just pass and watch your starting unit auto explore. Engagement with these longer term mechanics drives immersion and flow even when the minute to minute gameplay is sometimes less than compelling. Okay, so now that we've talked about different types of immersion and how it can be built up, it's time to look at the ways immersion can come crashing down around us. Since we described immersion as a flow state where there is as little friction as possible between you and the way that you are engaging with the game, it stands to reason that immersion is broken by sources of friction within that same game. This friction can stem from the source of the immersion itself, or just an interaction with a separate, less immersive aspect of the game. While it takes an awful lot of effort to build up that immersion, that illusion and flow can be shattered far more easily. First and foremost, a game with a poor interface can be difficult to get immersed in because the more effort it takes you as a player to interact with the game, the easier it is to get taken out of the experience. Since there are literally thousands of small and large ways immersions can be broken, and more examples from more games than I could possibly ever begin to list here, we'll have a look at ways that the games I've already name-checked as immersive in one way or another can have their immersion broken. For Red Dead Redemption 2, this break in immersion comes primarily in the form of playing through the main story. If you're wandering the world and seeing how it functions, immersion is not hard to come by, but watch as I load in here and try to get to start the next story mission. I have a specific objective in this game that I would like to complete, and the most efficient way for me to get to my goal was to hold down the X button, or cross for you mad pedants out there, and fiddle around on my phone for several minutes while my horse took me to where I wanted to go. There is no option to fast travel to the mission start point, and unsped up, this took me about 8 minutes from loading the game to getting where I wanted to be. There is a sense of friction between the game's world and its story, which can pull you out of any flow that you have going when there is long travel involved between story missions. I know some people might say that this travel makes you feel like a part of the world and that yes, you would have to travel if you were a real cowboy, but I'm playing a game, not you know a fully accurate cowboy simulator. If all I want to do is play the next part of the story and I'm being blocked from doing that, that really ruins my flow of being engaged with what's happening. Anyways, for Fallout New Vegas, the friction is largely mechanical. It's easy to be having fun roaming around the Mojave, completing quests and exploring, when technical glitches or crashes or troubles with the controls crop up. While I consider this game to be the greatest ever made, and it's easy to lose yourself in it while you quest about to the soulful refrain of Johnny Guitar, there is a lot of friction to overcome in the gameplay department that can frustrate and easily end your sense of immersion. 
As far as The Walking Dead is concerned, there is some friction in the gameplay department, but I found the thing that pulled me most out of the story was seeing the points at which the branching paths met back up and nullified the choices you'd made previously. Or where you make a choice and it's clearly the wrong one. For example, when I first played the game, I tried to save Herschel's son on the farm because I thought Duck was kind of annoying, honestly, and wouldn't be really useful in an apocalypse scenario. When it turned out that Duck would get saved and What's-His-Face dies no matter what, and we never see Herschel again, so now all I've done is succeed in getting Kenny pissed off at me for not saving his kid, while obviously not every choice can be hugely impactful, it can definitely hurt your immersion when you see that there is obviously a correct choice or a wrong choice, and it's even worse when you know that you've made the wrong one. Next up on our list is Pyre, and I initially struggled to think of a time when immersion suffered for me in this game since I was thoroughly engaged throughout and the mechanics are beautifully interwoven into the story, but upon further examination, that can be a double-edged sword. If you're really enjoying the story but either suck at it or don't like the gameplay sections, then they would serve as an unwelcome interlude getting in the way of your excellent visual novel, or a detriment to the story at worst. If you wanted to experience a story where your team is triumphant but there's a skill issue getting in the way of that, that could be a massive source of the friction with the game as the story you want to see told is kind of impacted by your performance. And I'm going to group the last couple games together since I think both Tetris Effect and Civilization can both lose immersion in the same way and that's payoff. For Tetris Effect, I feel as though there is a lack of long term payoff for what you're doing since although it is deeply mechanically satisfying on a moment to moment basis, if you don't care about high scores or unlocking avatars or trophies, then the repetitiveness of the gameplay with no significant evolution or longer term reward can make sustained immersion and long term commitment difficult. For Civilization, the end game has long been one of the most criticized aspects of the series, where you spend all this time immersed in the process of building your civilization up, and then once it's finally built up, you just kind of sit around at the end waiting for your influence to spread or your last technology to research. In my very first game of Civilization VI, I was in the middle of researching the final technology I needed for my victory when the timer hit 500 turns and I won a points victory instead. So often in these games the payoff for your efforts is a boring cruise to the end where you just pass turns waiting for your win condition to complete, breaking your immersion utterly and completely with no overarching goal left to strive towards. Okay you say, but what does any of that actually have to do with realism? Patience, Iago, patience. We're getting to that. This video was initially conceptualized as a rant about how realism ruins immersion, and no, the fact that you wouldn't be able to climb up a wet cliff barehanded in real life doesn't make me feel like it adds to my experience, it just sucks. But it took on a bit of a different shape during writing, as you might be able to tell. But I still want to touch on that piece of realism versus immersion since it is a somewhat commonly held opinion that the two things are intrinsically linked. Essentially, the point I hope I've made by now is that making something quote realistic doesn't necessarily equate to making that thing more immersive. If it serves engagement with the game in one of the ways we discussed, then realism absolutely makes the game more immersive, but it just as often gets in the way. I'll use an example from the IO Hitman series to show you what I mean. The Hitman games have some of the most impressive levels in video games, with nearly every individual having their own schedule, many of which are subject to change based on things you can do to affect the level. Many of these are quite realistic, for example violence, trespassing, or openly wielding weapons cause guards to investigate you. Makes sense. Realistic. People investigate noises, leave the area when someone gets murdered, and generally do all sorts of things you'd expect and want them to do. There is one major exception to all this though, and that is how guards react when you are not expressly violating a rule, but are still acting hella suspiciously. It's entirely unrealistic that you could go up to an armed guard, walk part way past him, get told to back off, and then stand right in front of his face staring at him for 5 minutes without being forcibly escorted from the premises. This would be a very easy thing to change, but it is clearly deliberate just like how Agent 47 can change clothes at superhuman speeds, and it's done for a simple reason. Being more realistic in these ways would break the flow of the game, ruin your immersion, and cause you to have less fun. Could you imagine we had to watch as Agent 47 laboriously put on each individual item of clothing for every costume he wears? It would be more realistic, sure but God would it ever be boring. The essential point that I'm getting at right here is that realism in some ways can increase the immersive qualities of game, but it can just as easily take away from that feeling of flow and immersion in others. A grounding in reality can help us understand the rules and provide us with a firm point of reference in the game that we're playing, but a strict adherence to it can get us bogged down in the annoying minutia of real life that we're trying to escape by playing games. 
I hope I've said some things that made sense to you today, and even if I haven't, I hope you enjoyed the ride anyway. If you were entertained at all by listening to me talk at length about this inconsequential niche gaming topic, let me know by liking the video and subscribing to the channel, or maybe even doubling my Patreon subscriber count from 1 to 2 if you're feeling saucy. I'd really appreciate any or all of that. See you next time.